Good evening and welcome. I'm Kelly Richards, CEO of the All Access Group and the host of All Access Radio. I've spent over two decades creating innovative alliances in the digital media industry and driving the convergence of entertainment, music, and technology between major media companies, technology companies, and established artists. My guest for tonight's show is Craig Chiquiso, former lead guitarist of the famous 70s rock and roll group Jefferson Starship, and of course notable in his own right in the smooth jazz world. Craig has been playing music professionally since he was 14 years old, and he's had over 30 years of success with acts such as the Jefferson Starship in the 70s, Starship in the 80s, and as a solo jazz and acoustic artist in the 90s and 2000s. He's released 11 albums as a solo artist, including Acoustic Planet, which was nominated for a Grammy in 94, and reached number one on the Billboard charts. And outside of recording music, Craig has worked with the Washburn Guitar Company to design his own signature series guitar, the Washburn EA-20. As an environmentalist, he's asked that the company plant a tree for each Chiquiso guitar made. Welcome to the show, Craig. Hey, hi, Kelly. You know more about me than I do. That was a a great (laughs) intro. Thank you. (laughs) Well, for for our our listeners, we're also very good friends. So I do know quite a bit about Craig, and I'm, I'm thrilled to finally have you on the show. Well, thank you. Same to you. Thanks. So, Craig, let's talk about the beginning of your career. You know, you started playing guitar professionally in clubs when you were only 14 years old, and I shudder to think what age you were when you joined Jefferson Starship. Tell us about that. (laughs) Well, I was lucky enough to start playing with people that were a little older than me, even going back to when I was 14 in high school, and was asked to join a band with my English teacher, Jack Trailer, who was friends with some of the members of Jefferson Airplane at the time, although I didn't really know any of that. I was just this young kid in town playing guitar, and one day after school, my English teacher told me to come by his class afterwards, and I thought, oh, no, I'm in trouble now. What, you know, what did I do now? <laughs> <laughs> I guess he had heard me play. I My band had played at the school, and he he wanted to know if I would be lead guitar player in his band. So I thought to myself, wow, I might help with my school grades, and I'll get a chance to play with some great older musicians. So as it turned out, you know, everybody in the band was about 15 years older than me and all had regular jobs, and I was the, the kid in the band that had to lie about my age and wear a fake mustache. And it got me started early, and I learned a lot of things from other players, you know, being that young and, and being around people that knew more and were more experienced was a, was a great gift. And then as long as I could remember to keep my fake mustache on and it wouldn't fall off in the ice cubes of my Coca-Cola and freak me out, you know, thinking, oh, my God, there's a caterpillar in my drink. <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> so, you know, there were a few moments like that where they would turn a black light on stage and the glue that I used to put the fake mustache on would fluoresce bright green, <laughs> you know, things like that. But it was through that experience that I later got to play with uh, members of Jefferson Airplane. Grace Slick and Paul Kantner came to some of our shows when we played in the Bay Area. And while I was still in high school, you know, thanks to this, this band I was in, I got asked to do some recording sessions here and there on, on Paul and Grace solo records. And, you know, after graduating high school and doing three albums as a guest musician like that with some great players like Jerry Garcia and, you know, David Crosby and Graham Nash and all these great players that were guests on the albums you know i I graduated from high school and my band got a recording deal on a jefferson airplane label and we toured opening for what was called jefferson starship and i played in both bands i played in the opening band and you know in the headliner and so after that tour i expected to go back to college and you know go back to art classes and stuff but i was asked to uh, stick around the bay area for a few months and do the first jefferson starship album and so after that, you know, that sort of became my higher education for the next 20 years, and I never did actually make it back to college yet. So that's no, kind of how that all got started. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a story. Well, you know, obviously when you were recording and playing with, with Jefferson Starship and Paul Kantner and Grace, you got to share the stage with a long list of legendary artists like Jerry Garcia and David Crosby and Carlos Santana and many others. And while I'm sure it's almost impossible to pull out only one or two stories. Could you give our listeners a, a peek behind the curtain and, and share some highlights of that era, if you can remember? Well, besides having fond memories of playing with all those people, some of whom I'd seen in concerts at Altamont and stuff as a member of the audience, you know, the one that, the, for some reason the one that stands out was doing some sessions while I was still in high school 
you know, my parents kind of gave me a reality check early on. As I was still riding my bicycle to school, and I was doing these like really cool recording sessions with these these famous people. But my parents laid the law down, and that was if I didn't keep my grades up, they wouldn't let me play guitar. So I always had this you know kind of balancing act going. Like, am I really getting to do this recording thing? And then you know, on the, the weekdays, I'm riding my bicycle to school. So it was kind of a weird. Best of both worlds or something. But I, I, during that time, I remember this because I was doing some rhythm guitar for a song that Jerry Garcia was going to play lead on. And the album had already been kind of divided up as to who was going to play lead guitar on what songs, you know. And Jerry was slotted to play a lot of the solos, and I did a, had already played a few myself. But on this particular song, I was going to play rhythm. And when it came time to do the solo, you know, Jerry wasn't at the session. And when the solo section came by, I got kind of inspired, and I played a solo through there. You know, thinking that they would just erase it later and, wow. and have Jerry redo it, you know. And so the story I heard was that Jerry showed up the next day to do his guitar solos and was doing them. And then when that song came by, they rolled it by and they they forgot to mute the guitar. And when he heard the solo go by, he just said, hey, that's a great solo. Why don't you let why don't you let the kid have another solo? I mean, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll never forget that. And I've, every time I saw him after that, I always wanted to give him a high four and a half for that one because uh, that, that was a great. great. I love yeah. it. What about Santana? That was my, that's probably the most memorable story that just comes off the top of my head anyway. Is, is there a Santana story in there? Well, you know, I think so because, again, I used to go see Santana play, and I had all his albums, you know, and my bass player now works with Carlos, too, in the recording studio, so it's an odd full circle in a way that during those years of being someone who was a fan of his and seeing him play on stage to actually sharing the stage with him, uh, my mom was great at collecting you know, articles and stuff, and she had a collection of articles. When she passed away, I was going through her stuff, and she had saved some articles and had some where I had played, you know, Carlos got on stage and jammed with us at Oakland Coliseum and stuff, and it was just neat to kind of flash back and see that, that my mom was really proud of that, obviously, and of course I am too, and, you know, so that that that's pretty memorable, you know, things like that. And then I, I, I played on a, a solo record for Greg Raleigh, where, I, again, I played rhythm on uh, some songs, and Carlos played lead on it, and I, I felt really, you know, honored to be on the, you know, the same recording with him in that way, and, you know, now, you know, years later, I get to do my own music, too, so. Yeah, for people that don't know, Greg Raleigh uh, is a fantastic singer and keyboardist, who, of course, was with the original Santana Band, and then was one of the early Journey members, too, and one of the original singers. That's right, no, ex- exactly yeah. right. And a great so, guy. All those experiences were great, great for me as a young, a younger musician to, to be able to play with people that were so uh, accomplished. You know, I'd like to think some of it might have run off, rubbed off on me in well, osmosis. I, I, I'm or sure something. it did. You know, Craig, when I first heard of you, came across you, I was myself going through college and working at Guitar Player and Keyboard Magazine. And, and my first foray with you was on the cover of Guitar Player Magazine, you know. I mean, by that point, your your career was well in hand. How was it for you when you started seeing yourself on the cover of magazines? Did you feel like you were really accomplished and one of the big guys at that point? Well, you know, I don't know if that ever really sank in totally. You know, I, I, sometimes I felt like, does this, somebody pinch me? You know, I've got the greatest job in the world. I get to play lead guitar, and, you know, uh, it was just, it was a dream come true. It, was, it had its challenges because there were so many different great players and songwriters in the band, uh, you know, in the Jefferson Starship Starship evolution that I had to kind of stay on my toes because my roots were a little more, you know, just kind of the rock-oriented stuff, but everybody else was writing that as well as some really diverse material. So I had to, you know, from songs like Miracles to, you know, some of the ballads and some of the, you know, just some of the creativity and the creative songs that were written by other people made me kind of look at my guitar playing a little more critically too and and try to figure out how am I going to play this song? You know, I felt like an actor in a movie that maybe played a few interesting roles and now was being asked to stretch and play some other personalities, you know, on literally on guitar. So that that sure. was kind of sink or swim in a way, you know, and I really appreciated it because it got me thinking in terms of different styles and tones and, and playing. So when I, you know, when I saw myself on covers of magazines, I, I a lot of times I thought, God, I hope nobody figures out I'm I'm still kind of winging it here. <laughs> when, <laughs> no, I, I when those things happened, well, it kind of made me a little nervous, you know. <laughs> I think you were well past that at that point. But, you know, you did still write and record Find Your Way Back in 1981. I'm not sure a lot of people know that that was your song, you know, with the Starship. And then and then recorded an amazing smooth jazz version for Acoustic Planet in 94. Do you see parallels between jazz, new age, and hard rock that you experienced as a songwriter and a musician? Well, you know, I always did think that there were all sorts of diverse elements in rock and roll, and I, I, I wasn't really... 
categorizing them as much as people have a tendency to do today. And I remember growing up listening to music that was pretty eclectic and varied, and, and like bands like the Stones and Pink Floyd and and your you know your rock bands were also using a lot of what I consider jazz textures and influences, the way they would interact with saxophone players, you know, and vocalists and yep. uh, guest vocalists and you know keyboard parts and and just the idea of using the stereo field in recording, you know, the left, right, middle, center, front, back, all those spatial elements of those productions really intrigued me, you know, the stereo aspect of it. And in in that broad spectrum of what you would call rock and roll bands, I heard a lot of what later became sort of jazz influences, you know, the percussion elements and, the, like I said, the saxophone players and the the keyboards and the pianos and the things that, that weren't necessarily part of a power trio, you know, like yeah, Dream or something, exactly. which I was a big fan of, but this was – you know, something that I, I thought I noticed a long time ago, that there were some influences going on. And I, I just figured there were two kinds of music, good and bad, and what good music was good music, and it had all these different uh, flavors in it. Now now I think there's more of a tendency to categorize each category and flavor and say, okay, this is smooth jazz, or this is rock, and this is that. But I, I think that my albums have a little bit of all that in them, too, and well, I've always I, I appreciated that. Right. And I think it probably comes from your sensibilities growing up in a musical family, which, again, I'm not sure a lot of people know about. Maybe you could share with our listeners what, what that was like and how that influenced you. Well, I, my mom and dad were both musicians when they were younger and then kind of settled down and, and got regular jobs to support a family. I say regular jobs because, you know, as always, being a musician hasn't always been that easy to do. And they realized that right away and, and loved music and played it around the house but didn't do it professionally you know, by the time I was born, but they would still play. You know, my dad would pull out the accordion or the saxophone, and my mom would play the. Uh, we had a, a organ in the uh, in the house, and mom would play the keyboards, and dad would would play along with her. And I just thought everybody did that after dinner when I was a little kid. I didn't know that other other families didn't do that. So, music was always around the house, but it was you know, as I started listening to music, I started gravitating towards my big brother's record collection, which was. Pretty eclectic. I mean, it went from Chet Atkins to Jimi Hendrix to Wes Montgomery to, you know, he was pretty wide range of music. So I started gravitating more towards the rock stuff. And, you know, I think if you ever walked by our house, you'd hear like, it would be like two radio stations on at the same time. There'd be my mom and dad playing these old classic, you know, songs of the 30s and 40s and stuff. And then there's this other sound coming out of the bedroom in the corner of the house with all this rock and roll guitar and stuff. (laughs) <laughs> it, I was encouraged to play, you know, and yeah. I always thought my heroes were, you know, again, Santana and all the guitar players, Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, who I had posters on the wall. But I realized now that I'm older and a parent that uh, that my heroes were, were really my parents who allowed me to play and bought me my first guitar and had those day jobs that paid for my school and my the roof over my head and all that stuff. So they, they were the real musical heroes in my in my life, you know, even to this day. So that was, I think that was a big influence and, and, a, and great to have parents that encouraged my music. I couldn't agree more. Now, obviously, you really grew up a lot in Jefferson Starship and the Starship, what became the Starship. They changed the name several times. But what were some of your biggest aha moments? I mean, traveling the world, winning all these awards as a band and just being on the pinnacle of everything, all the chart activity. What, what are the things you remember most fondly that you think were such big learnings for you as a as a, as a musician? Well, um, for some reason, the thing you mentioned that about awards, I haven't thought about this in ages, but we played the, you know, the Academy Awards and the Grammys, and I just remember how much cardboard and gaffer's tape is involved backstage <laughs> that you don't <laughs> see. It's like, oh, my goodness. It looks a lot different on TV. But I think some of the aha moments were, well, you know, when Jefferson Starship was – was getting all these number one songs and stuff, we were, I don't know if it was as much aha as it was surprise. Like, how did that happen? And Because I remember the early days of the band being pretty anarchistic in the sense that we all would just get together at a rehearsal and kind of play our ideas to each other, and then everybody would just kind of join in with what they felt like playing. It wasn't like we brought in, you know, arrangements and, you know, told each other what to play. It was pretty loose and... You know, everybody just was inspired and, and played what they thought was the best thing to play for that song. And none of us ever sat down and had a meeting like, okay, let's write a an album that's going to go to number one and have all these hits on it. You know, maybe somebody was thinking along those lines that I they never told me, but I, right. I never remember that conversation. And so when those albums did so well, we I think we were all kind of surprised, you know, that it was something that sometimes can happen by, I don't know if you call it luck, or by just divine intervention, or the fact that these people are getting together for one reason, and that's just to make good music and not necessarily 
to create these chart toppers. You know, maybe there's something to that where your motivation has an authenticity that's, that sometimes is hard to rationalize or compute or, or plan ahead. And I just, I always remember that of just sort of trusting your, you know, what's that line in Star Wars? Trust your feelings, Luke, you know, yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like that, where, where it seemed to pay off, you know, in that way. So that was kind of an aha moment for me. And then, you know, just realizing that it's also a job, you know, that there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. It's not just that hour or so on stage or that, you know, 20 second guitar solo that goes by so quick on the radio really took a long time to put that all together with a song and an arrangement and a recording and a mix and all the things that go into it. And I, and I would imagine it was a real team effort. Did you feel, were you made to feel like you were really a key member of the band? Was everybody like that or were there sort of, you know, weighted differences for, for certain, certain members? Well, you know, it felt, it felt like a family in that sense. You know, I was really amazed how welcoming the environment seemed to be for me as a younger player, being able to play with more established musicians. I don't know if it's so much that way today. I think I was pretty fortunate to find that that groove with everybody where they're, you know, it just felt so natural and organic the way we all got together and played. And I, I certainly was encouraged to play a lot of guitar and write. You know, I didn't feel a, a competitive friction with anybody. But I also felt, for in my mind, there was more direction and credibility from the, the people that had asked me to play with them. You know, when I thought of Grace Slick or Paul Kantner or everybody in that band, as a matter of fact, because they all had a, a heritage, I always looked to them as more of the leaders or the guidance but uh, I think I think Paul was considered to be more or less the leader of the band even though he would be the first to say that it was a democracy you know but then we'd all say it's a democracy as long as we all agree with Paul but (laughs) it was just a joke that went around but it really it felt a lot like a democracy and I really felt very encouraged but I also felt that you know I was kind of the new kid on the block too and you know it was important for me to kind of fit in you know, I didn't think I was the boss of the band, but I did feel like I got a lot of chances to express myself, and I thought that was really wonderful that, yeah. you know, to be encouraged like that. So and validated, yeah. if I might say, you know. No, you're right. I think that had a lot to do with it, and then it made it really paved the way for me to have the confidence and the uh, and the opportunity to do stuff on my own. You know, that never yeah. would have happened had I not been a member of that band and had those experiences and stuff with everybody. But I, but I think you really held your weight. I mean, even now, the songs are so, so much a part of the pop culture. But when I hear in my mind songs like Jane, you know, that's all you. It's all. Well, it's thank you. I mean, that guitar. was that. It's true that uh, there's a lot of guitar in that, and uh, but that was a group effort again. You know, I was a co-writer on that, but I did have a lot to do with the arrangement because it featured more guitar. And Ron Nevison, who had just started producing us, was more of a guitar-oriented producer too. I right. had a lot of his albums where he produced Bad Company and some Led Zeppelin, and uh, you know, UFO, and he went on to produce Heart. And but he had this this musical taste that appreciated guitar a lot. And right. So I, you know, Jane fit right in with that. Plus, we had a new drummer and a new singer at that time with Ainsley, Ainsley Dunbar, Dunbar and Nikki Thomas. A- a- Ainsley Dunbar, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And so, yep. you know, so during that period, it was it was a lot of fun for me as a guitar player. But I'll never forget we had a meeting in the studio when we first heard Jane, and I seem to recall our manager having a stopwatch and timing the guitar solo and saying that the solo was too long and that if it didn't get cut, that song would never get any airplay. And the rest of the band backed me up and I remember Ainsley and I kind of standing in front of the tape machine like the Dalton gang like don't get near this machine with a razor blade because <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and I saw the logic because our manager said well there's no songs on the radio that have those long guitar solos and, and everybody in the band still backed me up so when that song yeah. became a hit and every time I hear it on the radio now I have to smile to myself because I kind of had to fight for every second of that solo although our manager was right too because when I ran into the Metallica guys at an award show somewhere uh, they said, hey, when we were in high school, we really liked Jane because it was the only song on the radio that had a long guitar solo. <laughs> 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 well, we were both right, I guess. You know, They didn't play very many of those, but we got lucky. That's pretty so. funny. Now, the reason, you know, I, we've been friends a long time, but even you don't know this, is that the first time I saw you play, and of course with Starship, was in 1984 at a Santa Clara University concert where I happened to be right in the front row. And sure enough, there was... You know, Ainsley Dunbar on the drums, I remember that. And and you right out front. I think you were wearing some kind of a white suit or something. I don't know. Don't, don't catch my <laughs> memory, memory too much. But it was definitely amazing. And and Jane was just the blowout of the evening, you know. So Well, that, thank you. And I, like I said, we were all, you know, the, you, you, you've, when you're in a band, you have a lot of creative energies and juices going. And there's, you know, you're almost like living together and working together. So there, there's 
things that can develop, like little frictions or little things here and there. But for the most part, the band was really, I really enjoyed everybody in the band and felt like I got a chance to play a lot of guitar, maybe too much sometimes, but <laughs> it was great, you know. And I, I, I do remember one time, I love this memory of going into a Safeway and hearing one of our Starship songs come on the Safeway, you know, intercom system, yes. sound system. At, and it was a song that had an acoustic guitar solo, and I was just getting ready to do my first acoustic guitar album as a solo artist. And I thought, oh, this is kind of an omen. This is kind of cool because this is that song, that one of the few songs where I actually played acoustic guitar on a Starship record on a solo. And so I'm in line, and it's building up to the solo, and the chorus is ending. And right when the guitar solo starts, you hear this person come over the intercom go, can we get a price check in Broccoli, please? Can we price check Broccoli for price? And I thought, well, that's... That's how important the solo is right now. I mean, it's not as important as broccoli today. So I, oh, that is so <laughs> funny. But, you know, I mean, it's great. I, I meant to ask you, what's it like when you hear your own songs on the radio? Because I, when I hear your songs on the radio as my friend, I'm like, oh, my God, there's Craig. I would crank up the solo on Miracle or something if it's on the radio. There's Craig. You know, but well, different for you. You know, it's your song. So it's no, it, it is it is a thrill. I mean, to, the very, to this very day, I still get as excited hearing myself on the radio. You know, it's really fun to to, to hear that and. You yeah, know, things, as as things sound different. The music industry, it's still a thrill to hear your own stuff. It is. Right? It really is. There's, there's, there's no way around it. And then the other biggest thrill is just playing for a live audience too. I think some people prefer studios more than live, and vice versa. I think the studio is a little more like homework for me, whereas live is a little more like being able to have fun with what you've created. So and I, that never wears off. I always enjoy that. You know? Yeah, but knowing how creative you are in the studio, I've got to believe that there's, you know, there's a yin and a yang between what you, the time that you're in the studio and the creative experience you've got there, which, of course, is very different. Yeah, and I enjoy it. There's some really great creative moments. And, you know, you mentioned Washburn Guitars early on with my acoustic yep. records. They, they, they I helped design a guitar that was the sound on some of my earlier albums, but Carbon Guitars has been making my guitars and amps and stuff ever since the Starship days, and is really responsible for most of my sound and my, you know, my studio gear and all, a lot of my stuff that I do in the studio, I'm surrounded by Carbons, you know, and um, they've, they've made me a guitar now that I use live for all my stuff, you know, so the studio experience is, is really fun for me, but it's also, you know, I feel like if it wasn't for these these companies that make such great equipment now that we can all as musicians put something together in our house that's comparable if not better to the stuff you'd have to spend tons of money for in, in big large studios you know 30 years ago I and mean, now the way technology is as you know with apple and, and all yep. the computer companies you know it's, it's really a boon for us artists to be able to yeah i i i take great pride in having that's my claim to fame great great yeah. when i was apple was of course coming up with an alternative to having to be in the studio by having a mac and a pro tools rig right Yep, exactly. Or a, to, or a or a digital performer or whatever rigs there are out there. You're exactly right, right. and that right. it's really opened up a lot of space for all of us, you know. And you know, again, like I said, the carbon guitars and amps and, and stuff have been a big part of my sound going back to the Starship days. But you know, I kind of changed the direction there a little bit in the '90s and started doing yep. more music on acoustic guitar. You're, you're right in line with my segue. I was just going to bring that up. You know, after Starship broke up, you briefly had another hard rock band, Big Bad Wolf. And and then you went on to a much lighter sound with this new solo career as a jazz new age guitarist, which of course really sent you into the stratosphere in another direction. What prompted that transition from rock to new age and smooth jazz? Well, it, it wasn't a real conscious decision to go in a particular direction. It was it was the first thing I wanted to do was something a little more rock oriented. But it, looking back at it, the timing wasn't all that great because grunge was really starting to take a hold and the music that I was doing was a little bit more along the lines of, you know, Jane and some of those songs, you know, which weren't quite in that stylistic vein, you know. So we, we didn't have much encouragement with that project, even though it was a lot of fun to do and I worked with a singer named Rolf Hartley who has done a lot of studio work and, and he's a great you know, he, technically he's a real studio file kind of guy too. So him right. and I get along really well creating and working in studios. So that was, that was the advantage of working on the Big Bad Wolf project. It only came out in Europe and Japan as more of a melodic hard rock venture that didn't, you know, wasn't as popular at the time in America. But when I went to the acoustic stuff, little did I know that would lead to number one albums and Grammy nominations and this and that. It was more along the lines of being home and working and not touring as much. You know, my wife became pregnant. Funny how that works. You're home a yeah. lot. You're a musician. <laughs> Someone's going to get pregnant here. <laughs> So that was my first, I mean, that was our, our our only child, our first son. And during the pregnancy, I noticed that the acoustic guitar was a lot more welcome around the house than the electric. And I had no idea that it would turn into, you know, this musical direction that has really been a lot of fun to uh, 
to pursue. Sue, it was definitely a different direction than a lot of people probably would have thought I would have taken. But well, for sure. But I, I would argue it's been wildly successful for you. And of course, that's been what I hate to say, twenty years in that realm now. No, you're right. I think the 20th anniversary of my first solo album, Acoustic Highway, is coming up this year. And when I first started doing this music, a friend of mine who worked at Harley Davidson sort of said that he'd had a philosophy of when you're riding in a big group of motorcycles and everybody decides to turn, you know, right, sometimes it's kind of cool to lay back a little bit and then turn left because then you get the whole road to yourself. You're not lost in the crowd. And you know, you can kind of decide where to stop and where to look and where to go. And and he said, and musically, that's kind of what I did. Where well, a lot of people thought I might go take the right turn, right hand turn, and, and go into a band with more electric guitar, with vocals, and you know, just play the solos and the guitar parts. That to go left as a solo artist on acoustic guitar with no vocals was kind of a a different move that allowed me to maybe stand out from the crowd a little bit and have the whole road to myself for a while there. I think that's incredibly insightful, and of course ties to the, the name Acoustic Highway of that first yeah. album. But, you know, well, well, a lot of people do think of you, Craig, primarily for your platinum albums with Jefferson Starship. You were nominated for a Grammy for Acoustic Planet, and you have been so successful in all of these different realms as a solo artist, a studio musician, part of a band. Talk about the most striking differences. Is it easier for you to be creative and follow your passion as a solo artist, or do you, do you sometimes miss the camaraderie and collaboration of that bigger group? A little bit of both, although my band now has a lot of camaraderie. Some of the guys I've been playing with for 20 years, and everybody in my band, I think, deserves a lot of credit for for being able to, you know, sort of prop me up there, <laughs> because without yeah. them, it would be pretty boring. But my, you know, my keyboard player on my first solo records, Ozzy Allers, was a fantastic influence, and he had done some of the live Jerry Garcia recordings, and so as a keyboardist who was familiar with playing with a guitar player. Him and I had a real good co-writing, co-producing, co-everything you know, everything experience there. and So that helped a lot with my solo stuff. Now now my music is kind of a, a bit of both because my live sets do include some of the Starship stuff I played on and wrote as well as my, my own stuff. So we're sort of incorporating both facets of my, you know, what you would call my musical career, I guess. And yeah. You know, it, it works out great. The audience that seems to like the instrumental jazz stuff is pretty responsive to the rock stuff, too, as long as we don't overdo it, you know? So I feel like I'm in a very nice place to have the best of both worlds again, of that band camaraderie, as well as some of the rock tunes that were famous hits, you know, from my earlier days as to the stuff I do now in the same set. Uh, and I think it's a lot of the same audience that's kind of evolved, too, that moved into smooth jazz that were rock fans, et cetera, too. So that's, that's what I think, too. I, I really think that. I, I know that I'm still a big rock fan, but I know that even before I started doing this music, that there would be times at home where I would listen to other stuff. It's like every, I think a lot of us won't just listen to one style of music nonstop. It's kind of nice to have that variety. And so the people that grew up with rock and roll like I did, a lot of them have expanded their, their taste and listened yeah. to other stuff too. So it's been a great experience being able to touch both bases. And now I'm working on an album that's more blues-based. So I think even that has a connection to all of the the jazz and the rock that I did. I think blues is still a, a fundamental element of a lot of that music. And so for well, me, and I, I'm... And I love, I love how you sort of reinvent yourself every 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it is that long. You know, you're riding the wave of the next genre because you came on to smooth jazz and practically helped define the category. Well, you know, it's weird It's to hear you say that, and it's like, oh, man, it's, it's real, really nice to hear because when I first started doing that style of music, I wasn't really thinking so much of an album, but... The more I did it, the more I thought this could be an interesting project. And it really got passed on by several labels, you know, because we I didn't know what it was going to be called or where to go. I thought I heard rock and blues and jazz and, you know, these different elements in it. So I first place I went to was more of a, a new age kind of instrumental label. And they said, well, we hear some new age and rock and jazz and blues, but, you know, it's if you sounded more like, you know, say Otmar Liebert or someone that was in their category, we might sign you, but why don't you take it to a rock label? So I took it to a rock label, and they said, well, we hear some rock in there, but we hear some jazz and blues and new age. If you sounded more like, you know, say a rock player like Joe Satriani or something or Steve Vai, we'd we'd want to do it. So I heard this all over the place. Blues, same thing. Right. Well, we hear some blues, but we also da-da-da. If you sounded more like Robert Cray, da-da-da. And so I felt like on one hand you have to sound like yourself, but if you don't sound as like someone they already have in their style, they don't want to sign you. So this went back and forth, you know, until finally a label put it out, and it was the number one album of the year in Billboard for an independent label. And, 
you know, I'd like to think that now people are saying, if you sound more like Craig Chikiso, we'd sign you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I heard just the octave. opposite. Yeah, it was higher octave. And, yeah, give credit for um, it, too, because, you know, it helps Absolutely. No, those guys well. are the best. They were the best label to be on, and uh, they were more of a new age label, too, as it yeah. turned out. And uh, yeah. they, they were the first ones that said, don't sound like anybody else. We like you because you sound like you. So for you to say that now, 20 years later, is like, oh, my gosh, it's just so nice to hear because at the time it was real kind of discouraging and scary not to have anybody, you know, want to put the record out. So well, we to finally have it come out now. and have it. We look back, yeah. Craig, on, on 20 years of, of smooth jazz being a wildly successful category. And you yes, were right the I know. I was, and who who would have thunk? You know, somebody up yeah. there must like me because it it was very scary at the time, and even sweeter now to hear that when someone sure. like you says that. So, well, you know, and I, I like to bring that out just because I know a lot of artists that get, you know, discouraged, and a lot of actors and writers and stuff, and it's kind of hard to know when to give up or when to keep going if you're you're hearing a lot of no's. But someone once told me it's not the no's that count; it's the one yes that really counts. Yeah. Yes, and that was the one yes that counted. Now, Craig, uh, speaking of which, it does get lonely out there. What or who inspires you as a solo artist? Oh, as another solo artist? I've always been infatuated with Jimi Hendrix, you know, and I, I, it still boggles my mind that he was only around for too many short years. Uh, I mean, n- not enough long years. In other words, he was only around for three or four years making records, and right. yet he was so influential. And the way he used the studio as, a, as an instrument always intrigued me. And, you know, if you look real close at my albums and some of my titles and album notes, you can tell I'm kind of nodding to Jimmy in, in a, a lot of little subtle areas there because he, he really captivated me with his production and his guitar playing and the way he innovated and the whole idea of stereo panning and stuff really stayed with me and I love the way that's reflected in a lot of the Pink Floyd and the early classic rock albums that I listened to there was just something really fascinating about creating that environment for your ears that was so almost 360 you know 360 degrees of of absolutely that may be an example of who has inspired you now when we think about what has inspired you I know you're very into uh, spirituality and healing through music and so it's no accident that smooth jazz new age kind of go together but could you talk a little bit about that side of, of your work? Well, yeah, that was, that was, again, that was one of those serendipitous moments where you don't really plan it. You just find yourself there. And um, when I was a kid, I got hit by a drunk driver. My dad and I were hit. A guy, a guy crossed the line and uh, hit his head on, and I broke both my arms, my thumb, my wrist, my leg, my foot, my ankle, and uh, woke up in the hospital with all these casts on. And the first thing I asked for was my little acoustic guitar that my doctor encouraged me to play because I think she knew it was good for my circulation and stuff, but also that it was good for my soul and my healing emotionally as well as physically. And so I never forgot that. And I wrote a song, even though my fingers only stuck out about an inch out of my cast, I was able to rest the guitar neck and cast and touch the one high E string. So I wrote a song in the hospital on the E string that later showed up on a Grammy-nominated album of mine. It was on the Acoustic Planet album 30 years later. And I subtitled it E. Elizabeth's Song because E was the only string I could read, the high E string, and my doctor's name was Elizabeth. And so there's this song on there that was inspired by her and in the hospital and, and having music get me through a difficult time. Now, since then, when my first solo record came out, I decided to go back to that hospital and find my doctor and thank her, but she'd already retired, so I couldn't find her. And I ended up playing for the kids and the family and the staff that were in the same hospital I was as a little kid. And having done that, one thing led to another where I, I realized there's an organization called American uh, Music Therapy uh, Association that brings music into hospitals and works with doctors and musicians to bring in the healing qualities of music and even though you know it's it's something you can't right off the top of your head tangibly say music heals if you look back thousands of years over our shoulders societies have been using music for all kinds of healing and 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 stuff and now western medicine as great as it is is also starting to look over their shoulder and say well we don't know why but when we introduce music our patients have a faster recovery rate their heartbeats are lower they're more you know, you can sedate them without using as many drugs. There's less side right. effects. And for people with head injuries and Alzheimer's, things like that, music can actually go in there and restart some of those and help rewire some of those things in the brain that have been damaged by illness or an injury. Absolutely. Like that. Absolutely. So, Autism yeah. would be another area where that would be helpful, I would imagine. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, you know, there's uh, stories like that where people have been, been re- didn't remember their wife when they saw them, but when they played some music they used to listen to when they that's dated. That's right. That's you know, right. the guy gets up and has a tear in his eye and kisses his wife and smiles and remembers her. So 
That's got to be so validating for you, and it comes full circle from your own experience, of course. Well, it does, and I, it was one of the coolest things that happened was that I at a, a concert in Sedona, Arizona, one of my well, someone who likes my music is actually a private detective, apparently, and she found my doctor, and we called my doctor backstage from an outdoor concert in Sedona, of all places, a beautiful outdoor show in Sedona, and we called my doctor, and we said, hey, by the way, if you remember this kid from 40 years ago, he wrote a song for you, and he's playing at this concert in Sedona, so with the technology and the iPhones and stuff, they, we were able to send her uh, you know, a little bit of my music from Sedona, thanks oh, for her so great. great work. I love that. <laughs> it's kind of fun. She may not be a big guitar music fan, but at least she knows that she heard she did enough work on my hands and fingers that they seem to work okay these days. I think she. I think you owe her a debt of gratitude. That's fantastic. And you know, <laughs> some of the other songs you've done, as I say, have had influences. It seems from Native Americans and other elements in, in, that are important to you. Return of the Eagle comes to mind. Angel Tears where you're really bringing some spirituality into the music. And I think that's... Well, I try to do music that tells a story that kind of paints a picture. And a lot of that inspiration is from being in places that are dramatic and in nature and, and kind of resonate with the way Native Americans seem to live in harmony with that. And, you know, I remember being in the desert and looking out across at mesas on the horizon, being lit up by, you know, dry lightning and thunderheads punching into the sky and spreading out in these big flat shapes and watching millions of ice crystals sparkling in the setting sun and all of this happening outdoors and realizing there's a symphony going on here. There's This is something that besides taking a picture or uh, filming, you can create this environment with music. And so some of my songs like Sacred Ground and Gathering of the Tribes and Native Tongue and Dreamcatcher are all allude to these experiences I've had outdoors and Return of the Eagle, you know, watching an eagle fly and remembering, you know, that connection that Native America had with that as being a part of that symphony, if you will, of nature, being right. a part of it and not, not owning it or controlling it. So, you know, I like to think that my music reflects that. And when someone says, man, I got turned on to your music while I was camping or while I was hiking or whatever, you know, it kind of reminds me, well, that's that's kind of where my music started. A lot of it started from me being turned on to camping and hiking. So, so it's kind of neat to hear that. Exactly, circle. exactly. And you know, I, I get that. Just that, I'll tell you, as a past employee of Apple, as you know, I was so impressed when Steve Jobs put acres and acres of apricot trees into the plans for this grand new ca campus that's being built in the shape of a spaceship here in Cupertino. And yeah. similarly, I heard a cool little tidbit about when you were designing the Craig Chiquiso Signature Series guitar with Washburn guitars that you wanted to give something back. So you and Washburn agreed to have a tree planted for each guitar sold. I'd love for you right. to expand on that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, I thought that here was a, a renewable resource that we're using wood to make these guitars. And if I'm writing songs about appreciating the environment, I wanted to give something back. So I suggested that they have a tree planted for each guitar. And there's a sticker in the sound hole that says that for each of those guitars, a tree's been planted. And, you know, they were they were open to it, but they just thought it might be really complicated. Well, it turned out it wasn't that hard to do. There's organizations like American Forest and uh, Relief, I think. And, you know, there's a lot of organizations they were able to work with to ensure that a tree got planted. And, you know, I said, I don't want this to be like a Christmas tree in a Christmas tree lot, okay, that gets chopped down. And so this has to be like a real tree and a real thing. And so they worked with these organizations where they found a tree uh, – areas where the, the local trees had been depleted drastically and started replanting and reforesting in those areas. So I was really proud of that. I'm glad they followed along with me. And then, I, then of course, then I found out that I, it wasn't such an original idea. And apparently there's been companies and piano companies and, and musical instrument companies that have done that before, but I had never heard of that. And so I was sort of glad we kept the ball rolling, even though we weren't the first to ever do it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was fun to do. That's cool. Well, you know, Craig, with such a long and amazing career that you've had, along with all these wonderful philanthropic ventures, what do you most want to be remembered for? Well, you know, I'd like to be remembered by my, you know, my family and my son as being a good dad and stuff. And, and maybe someday, you know, my son will walk through a forest with his son and say, you might not remember your grandfather very well or ever know any of his music, but these trees are here because he played guitar. <laughs> so mm -hmm. something like that that could last for a long time and others could appreciate it would be nice to be remembered for. And, of course, you've got a wonderful musical legacy that, that, will, that will live on forever as well, which has got to be something you're very proud of. Well, but, thank um, you. I like to, talking to you like this makes me, feel, uh, makes me feel very proud, I must say. So thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Craig. Well-deserved. 
But, you know, looking forward as we wrap up our time together today, I'd just love to hear what's next in store. Obviously, the Blues CD is, is, is in progress. Are there any other projects that you're working on that you can you could tell us about? Well, you know, there was a live album that we started recording a few years ago, but every time we decide to to mix it and or add something to it, we realize that our live shows changed again, and we keep wanting to <laughs> add the, the newer elements. So, so somewhere down the line, we're going to get an, a live album done. But every time we change something in the set, we want to add that too, so we keep recording a live album. But the blues album is what I'm most excited about on Blind Pig Records, which is, if not the number one uh, blues label, it seems to be the one that's most recognized by my musician friends and stuff. That that's been a, an exciting project for me because I've I felt that my music has sort of been influenced by the blues going back to the rock guys that I used to listen to when I was growing up and of course they were influenced by the blues players before them so my my influence kind of comes around maybe third generation so my blues record is going to be definitely inspired by some of the earlier blues guys like Robert Johnson and the guys from the 20s and stuff but I didn't turn on to their music by listening to them I got turned on to their music by listening to other musicians that were listening to them so this was kind of a an evolution if you will of that inspiration that's going through several generations of musicians and I'm just happen to be the one kind of picking it up right at this point and in my own little world and my reference place for it to to do a blues record with that idea in mind so we'll we'll see how how it turns out you know I, i'm definitely excited about it as a guitar player getting a chance to play these different styles on a, a record that will include more electric guitar this time and as well as some acoustic but it's sort of my idea of what the blues has been to me you know and yeah. my experience so yeah very very good well i look forward to hearing it of course and to seeing you play play the music live whenever that all comes about but for now, for any of our listeners, the place to go is com to stay abreast of what Craig's up to. And, Craig, I just want to thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight. It's been just a real pleasure to have you on the show. Of course, my pleasure, Kelly. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to seeing you at a show here real soon. Yeah, and thanks to all our listeners, as usual, for joining us on the show. We look forward to hearing you again the same time next week. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye.